Welcome to the Providence College Podcast. My name is Joe Carr. Today's guest is Joe Small, a distinguished alumnus from the class of 1974, an English major and an MLK scholar. Joe was a student leader during the tumultuous early 1970s, and he has had a very successful career in technology and publishing, working all over the world. Joe is also a leader in working to foster justice and representation for people of color in the workplace and beyond. And his encore career, which we will talk about in a bit, traces back to his days as a WDOM DJ. Joe, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Joe. I'm so pleased to be here. I'm, I'm humbled for this opportunity just to share my my uh, my little story. Oh, it's it's a great story, and we're we, we're delighted to have the opportunity to share it with our alumni family. And with alums, I always like to start by talking about the pathway to PC. How did you make your way to Providence growing up? in the South Shore area? Well, I grew up in Duxbury. I'm a member of the class of 1970 Duxbury High School. And our high school guidance counselor, the late, great Walter Kennedy himself, uh, was, a, was a friar. He went to Providence College and he was there and, and really helpful to me um, in presenting me with an alternative path uh, to going to a really great school. I originally wanted to go to Marquette. Uh, but my dad felt that going to Wisconsin was just too far, being the oldest of six. And so I had to settle for uh, another school that was uh, pretty stellar in basketball, which was, you know, I really liked watching the Friars on, on television at that time. And uh, good old Dr. Walter Kennedy uh, made it possible for me to visit the campus. Well, and I fell of, in love with it. Speaking of Marquette, their national championship was in that era, wasn't it? Absolutely. Dean, the dream memminger, whom I got to meet many years later. And I shared with him that story that I wanted to follow him out <laughs> to Marquette. Uh, Joe, if you would paint a picture for us of Providence College in the early 1970s. The war in Vietnam was ongoing. Kent State happened when you were a senior in high school. It was a, a time of great social unrest. What was it like at PC? Well, it was a very strange uh, place for me, not in the context of it being negative, but rather uh, to find myself attending, of all places, um, an institution that was a male institution and a Catholic institution. Um, I grew up Protestant um, and uh, finding myself on campus and actually being the member of the last all-male freshman class, there were times when some of us freshmen, uh, we would get on the city bus in Providence just to ride through the city, just to see some girls that were not dressed up as nuns, if you, if you will. Um, certainly there were campus protests going across town over at Brown University. There were a number of protests going on there. And, and so we felt that the way that we could connect um, to some of the social justice movements that were taking place in Providence uh, was to go across town and at least, you know, from a solidarity standpoint, participate. We knew we could not uh, engage in protests per se on campus but at least we knew we had an outlet to, uh, to express solidarity. Tell us a little more about what it was like to be a young man at that time. I would suspect that you knew people who went to war, went to Vietnam, and there was this great this division in the country that persisted through this time period. Indeed. In fact, some of my uh, dearest friends ended up uh, being drafted and going to Vietnam. Thank God they came back uh, safely. And yet one of my closest friends, uh, unfortunately, ended up with a low draft number and did not have college uh, as an option right then and there. And so he unfortunately uh, had to make that tough choice uh, and leave the country rather than go to Vietnam. And we saw a number of young men uh, make that difficult decision. Um, thank God he's back. Uh, and, uh, you know, they provided amnesty for those who uh, who left without being drafted. And, uh be able to put that that whole era behind us. To your description of what PC was like at that time, could you add some detail about the particular challenges faced by Black students? My class, uh, class of 74, as we entered in 1970 as freshmen, uh, there were 16 of us. In fact, to the, my best recollection, we were members of the largest uh, entry class of black male students in the school's history. I don't think that they had as many uh, uh, young men of color coming on campus at one time. And so immediately we formed a brotherhood, if you will. 
Uh, just about all of us were housed right there in uh, Raymond Hall, which was the hall reserved for freshmen. Uh, one of two floors we found ourselves on. Um, and uh, in a very playful way, we even referred to our section of the hallway as the ghetto, you know what I mean? And, and uh, really embraced uh, that brotherhood. Um, I was probably one of just a small handful who were coming from suburban, uh, suburban communities where the other brothers were from places like Roxbury and Harlem and DC and Philadelphia. And of course they brought their, their urban hard scrabble uh, social outlook and uh, certainly teased us to no end. But one of the things that really served as uh, the glue from a social standpoint we fell in love with a card game called Crazy Eights. And man, you want to talk about playing Crazy Eights, which is an extension of, uh, of um, spades, if you will, or, uh, and, and just talking smack talk, trash talk throughout the entire game. And uh, to this day, there's a group of us who will still make every effort to come together and, and have a reunion. And of course, the cards come out and we're playing crazy. <laughs> well, that sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the, the enduring nature of those relationships with um, among the guys in that, in that cohort that you're describing there. Well, again, we're freshmen on campus at that time, and we had a number of upperclassmen. A good number of them were actually ball players on the, on the varsity squad. Um, that time when we came in and my fellow classmates like Marvin Barnes, uh, they were freshmen and they, they had not allowed freshmen to play varsity at that time. So we had upperclassmen, uh, brothers like Gary Wilkins and Donnie, uh, 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 I'm, and I just went blank on his name, uh, Donnie Lewis uh, and uh, um, Al Cook and George Solomon, uh, um, Ray, uh, these were the, the big brothers on campus. They played basketball. Um, they were role models for us. They were big brothers. Uh, and they really kept us in line, kept us out of trouble. Um, you know, really showed us the way uh, in terms of how you manage yourself, how you survive and thrive on a campus that's predominantly white all male and and very relatively uh, conservative by by standards from where many of us uh, came from and from your classmates a number of success stories including you of course but a lot of these guys did very well great careers and you know really uh, a credit to that group of, of young men no question about it um, and we give a lot of credit to uh, some of the experiences that we've had to go through you know you it's sort of like uh, baptism by fire or where iron is forged in fire. Um, we certainly encountered our fair share of, of some bias uh, and various obstacles that would threaten to break your spirit, if you will. Uh, but to, to the credit of some of the administrators on campus and certainly our upperclassmen, um, they held us together, held us up. Um, there's one incident, of course, that will always remain in our hearts and minds until our last breath, which was uh, the winter of 1970, when um, we had uh, a very difficult and challenging issue that involved one of our upperclassmen basketball players who was dismissed from the team. Um, his scholarship was taken uh, because of his attitude which was precipitated by lack of playing time. But how the administration responded uh, was just not acceptable to those of us uh, as, as students um, to take away a player's scholarship and to find out later that that particular player um, didn't have full benefit of the academic rigor that many of the other students of color and all students on campus had opportunity to experience. As you can imagine, if you're playing on a team which requires X number of hours of practice time, how much time is left to get your academics? And unfortunately, in some cases, some of our athletes are receiving, shall we call it, social promotions, which maintains their eligibility 
but they're denied real opportunity in which to grow uh, academically and to acquire the necessary life skills to be successful after playing basketball. And here was one example of that having happened. And so we decided to dig in our heels. Um, we went on television uh, on a Sunday morning program and shared our pain, our angst with respect to what was occurring. And we felt we needed to let people know that this was not acceptable. Uh, we found that initially the administration's response was to, to attempt to disprove our position but that really wasn't going to hold water. And so over a period of several weeks, up to and including the basketball team, uh, threatening to boycott the holiday tournament in Madison Square Garden. And the administration brought in uh, several celebrated um, basketball alumni, who many of whom had played in, at the professional level, uh, and the one that I remember most fondly was none other than the late, great John Thompson, who came into our dormitory room where we were all meeting together as a group of, of Black students. And basically, as I remember him sharing and saying, I heard the administration's side. Now let me hear your side. And that was profound. It was, for me personally, um, a tremendous learning experience about how you negotiate and navigate uh, certain power structures and do it in a very professional way. Uh, he encouraged us to put our concerns, our demands on paper, which we did. I believe we had a total of 13 demands, uh, many of which included asking the administration, demanding the administration set in place support systems for students of color so that they had not only academic support but that they also had uh, the emotional uh, and just the, the life skills support, uh, particularly again, coming from uh, inner city onto a, uh, a college campus like Providence College where you're feeling alienated and you need a safe space to be able to go sit down and trust that someone's gonna give you good advice. And so 12 of those 13 demands were met, which created, if you will, not only the, um, uh, the, at that time, the Black Student uh, Association, which included an advisor, um, the late great uh, Father Robert Morris was, was our first advisor, then followed by uh, Dr. Kamasong, Willesi Kamasong, uh, and then uh, the late great uh, Robert Hampton. Uh, just great people who were right there who helped all of those students of color matriculate successfully through Providence College. Where does a group of young men, 18, 19, 20 years old, find the courage to take those steps? How did, what did you draw from for that? I personally um, grew up in a household where my parents were very strong role models. Uh, my dad, self-made entrepreneur, um, after getting his mechanical engineering degree from Wentworth Institute, went to work for Raytheon, and then with the encouragement of his boss at Raytheon, dad started his high precision tool and die company in the basement of our home in Duxbury, six months later, opening up his first uh, full-time machine shop, precision machine shop in Rockland, Massachusetts, by the name of Small Trend Engineering. Uh, fast forward through those uh, early years at Providence College, I would come home on weekends and certainly some of my summers and I'd work in the family business. And my dad would send me out on uh, sales calls, if you will, to the likes of Western Electric, IBM, uh, GE, uh, even as far as Washington DC to talk to uh, buyers, mechanical buyers uh, associated with NASA. So I, I learned from my dad. Uh, he modeled for, for me and for my siblings, my brothers and sisters, you know, what it means to be professional, what it means to be dedicated, and what it means to be able to sacrifice. My mom, equally, um, was very active in various social service organizations, including the National Association of, of Negro Business Women uh, back in that era. Um, she, too, uh, went on to become and manage a, um, a car dealership as a general manager. So having a professional working mother having an entrepreneurial father uh, growing up 
in a household with both parents who could really model uh, for me and my, and my siblings helped me personally. But what I also found in going to Providence College is that my classmates uh, came with their own set of skills and backgrounds where we're able to complement each other. And again, remember, I talked about that brotherhood. So here we are, freshmen, we're hanging tough, we're socializing, we're encouraging each other to, to do your necessary uh, homework, keep your grades up so you don't flunk out. We, no one wanted to flunk out of Providence College, I can tell you that. Um, and so those support structures were in place to basically carry all of us through to uh, the finish line and graduate. Of the 16 that arrived on campus as freshmen, eight of us graduated on time, and there was probably another four uh, that came in one or two years uh, behind us. By the way, just to backtrack a little bit, considering your experience with John Thompson, by the way, an alumnus from the class of 1960, what was it like to watch his career develop and to seem to become such a successful coach, but also a leader and a mentor for the young men who played for him at Georgetown and an inspiration, inspiration for so many other people? You're absolutely right. In fact, um, my youngest sister and, my, and her husband, my brother-in-law, they're both uh, George, um, Georgetown Hoyer uh, alums. They met at Georgetown. My sister's a doctor. My, my brother-in-law is a, uh, an insurance executive. Um, and when we would talk about John Thompson, and you can imagine, if you will, while they're matriculating at, at Georgetown, and of course, we're watching him as a coach on television, the one thing that we all agreed on was the fact that John Thompson carried himself in a dignified, graceful way in the face of adversity, if you will. If you remember back in the days when Georgetown would come in to uh, play uh, other institutions, and at that time, I believe he might have been the only black coach of a Division I school, and they'd get all kinds of boos and all types of microaggression, and he would tell his ball players, all right, you can carry a chip on your shoulder, but don't let them knock that chip off. Maintain your dignity, bring your A game, and always, always uh, don't speak ill of your opponent. And I'll tell you, I, I want to believe, though, that, um, that those lessons that John Thompson exhibited probably, mostly, hopefully, were honed during his years at Providence College. And among the people he influenced? Ed Cooley, the Big East coach of the year right here with the Friars. There you go. Brings it full circle to some extent, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, you mentioned Father Morris, people who uh, were students during the time frame when you were a student here, almost every single one of them has something to say about Father Morris. Uh, I have to admit, I never met him. But tell us a little bit more about what he was like and what his impact was on the college and its students. <sighs> He was like a surrogate father for many, many uh, of our students of color at Providence College, uh, including um, the, the females, the co-eds, when they arrived a year later. Um, some of our students may not have had fathers in their lives on a consistent basis. Uh, and so imagine, if you will, being able to feel comfortable enough to sit down with Father Morris and share with him whatever's going on in your personal life. And to have him take that nurturing, loving, unconditional, non-judgmental, but yet firm role. And that is just invaluable, the stories. Um, I, my experiences with him, I will only share that uh, um, I, got in trouble by uh, violating curfew. Uh, mind you now, we're freshmen and you're not supposed to have girls on campus after a certain hour. Well, you know, the visiting girl from Salve Regina unfortunately missed the bus back to campus. And uh, uh, long story short is I had this come before Father Morris and, and uh, mea culpa, mea culpa, I promise I'll never <laughs> do it again. Um, and I just have to tell you that um, he really instilled in me a sense of 
um, responsibility, taking responsibility for your actions, um, setting an example um, that I've tried to uh, remember throughout the rest of my life. And there are times when, you know, you kind of wander off that path and immediately you hear in the back of your mind, you know, that, that conversation with Father Morris. A uh, special Dominican and certainly a seminal figure in the second half of the college's first century, uh, certainly because everybody has stories like, like that about Father Morris. I'd like to talk a little bit more about your parents, because when we chatted the other day, you shared a great story about the beginning of your father's business and your mother's uh, statement to him about, about, well, it's time to to turn this into something. <laughs> Would you go through that yeah. for us, please? So again, um, my dad working for Raytheon uh, as a high precision tool and die maker. Uh, and he was of course the, uh, at that time, the only uh, black tool and die maker in this department at Raytheon. And unfortunately uh, his white coworkers uh, really were not supportive of, of integration at that point. And so what was happening was they were sabotaging his machine. Uh, and when my dad realized this was happening, uh, dad would show up an hour or so before his shift to recalibrate his machine to make sure he wasn't turning out, you know, junk material. Um, his boss, his foreman, saw dad's dedication, asked him what he wanted to do, and dad said he wanted to start his own business. So he said, look, I'll help you do that. I'll give you some piecemeal work that you can take home and then just set up a, a small uh, lathe and drill press in the basement of the home, which he did. And then six months later, uh, dad's working the late shift and uh, at Raytheon, and uh, it's around nine o'clock at night, and the bulkhead door is opening, and our dog is barking like crazy, and mom says to me, go down and see what's going on. So I grab my baseball bat and the dog, go downstairs, and just as I get down to the basement, before I can cut the lights on, the bulkhead door opens, there's a silhouette of this giant giant of a man and in a Scottish broguish accent, he says, easy lad. He says, my name is Andy McDonald and I am your father's second shift. And I was like, holy cow. <laughs> and I go back upstairs and of course, Andy cuts on the light and he's like six foot five. He's got red hair, he's got red beard. And I just fell in love with this guy who ended up working for my dad for over 15 years. I went upstairs and I said to mom, you're not going to believe this. I said, dad's hired an employee and his name is Andy. And of course, when dad came home, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes later, mom says to him, if you need to hire someone, it's time to move that business out of the basement. And certainly he did. The rest is history. That's, that's a great, great, great story. Uh, by the way, speaking of history, back to your student days, it turns out you changed the course of the art scene in Rhode Island by introducing your friend and roommate, John Chan, to jazz. Tell, tell us about that. If I may, bear with me. I got to represent. This is one of John's T-shirts, Chan's nice. jazz and egg roll. <laughs> um, John and I, roommates, we met in the cafeteria line of Raymond Hall back in 1970. Um, what can I say? When we uh, came together as roommates and hauling in our uh, albums in these uh, big orange crates, uh, he's got, of course, all of the rock, uh, Beatles and Rolling Stones and The Who and you name it. I'm coming in with with my, um, my jazz albums. And... Um, also, my cousin, Nehru King, who was a year ahead of us. So Nehru is class of 73, also a member of that Final Four team. Um, so we all came together. And the common bond was music. And thank goodness, at that point in time, we're now residing in uh, St. Joe's. Uh, and in the basement of St. Joe's, Joseph Hall, was the radio station WDOM. And so it was a no brainer when opportunity came to um, sign up uh, to become DJs, take the test, pass the FCC licensing, and off we went uh, with our own uh, radio programs. And uh, so through that, that combination of experiences of sharing our love for 
uh, the variety of music, R&B, jazz, and including some of rock, uh, it stuck with John to the point where when upon graduation, John returned to the family restaurant in Woonsocket, Chan's, and uh, he persuaded his dad uh, to let him bring in some live music. <laughs> and who knew that uh, of all things, it would be and become the institution that it is today. And John Chan, by the way, recognized by Providence College with an honorary degree just a couple of years ago. So, so uh, a well great, done. great, great alum who has done Absolutely. so much for the arts, performing and visual uh, yeah. throughout the state of Rhode Island, really Southern New England, uh, for sure. And then WDOM, you and I are just two of many people for whom WDOM changed our Providence College experience and in some sense, the courses of our lives. I mean, really a, a great, great thing to have access to. It certainly helped me, uh, especially after college and uh, getting my my job, first job in uh, uh, computer programming, becoming a programmer, programmer analyst, and eventually working my way through the ranks and education publishing, uh, and being able to lend my voice to the first generation of uh, eBooks, if you will. Let's talk about your encore career first, then we'll go back to your primary career since we're on this track of WDOM. So those talents nurtured at PC uh, have brought you to this work as a producer, an actor, a voiceover uh, performer. Tell us a bit more about this work and, and what kind of fulfillment you're finding in this. I've always loved the performing arts. Um, my mom made sure that all of us kids got some exposure to the arts up to and including on those Saturdays. We'd get on the buses that would take us into Boston to the Symphony Hall for the, the, the kids' uh, uh, Boston Pops Saturday programs. Um, loved participating in school plays. And of course, when you go off to college, your father says, get a real job. And so you got to get a real job. But deep down inside, when that opportunity came to retire uh, from education publishing after 40 years, um, I knew I didn't want to just sit on the sofa and do nothing and watch the news. I knew I wanted to stay active. And to my good luck and fortune, I found uh, a local community access television station uh, in Hingham, Massachusetts, that was welcoming me as a volunteer. And I lent my voice to do some volunteer uh, public service announcements. And before you know it, it started to take on a life of its own. And I got some really cool opportunities to do some modeling, uh, to do some live theater, uh, to audition and snag a few commercials. People remember me on a Blue Cross Blue Shield commercial that ran for a few years. I ended up getting my Screen Actors Guild card, SAG card, uh, been able to produce a few programs and worked on my first documentary, a short form documentary called Taking a Toke, uh, which is all about the dangers of uh, adolescent vaping or e-cigarettes and how much damage that has done to our youth. Now that you mention it, of course, I remember you from the Blue Cross <laughs> Blue Shield commercial. So that was a great spot. And uh, and I'm sure that's that's fulfilling and interesting work. But your first career, as you mentioned, edu mentioned in educational publishing, is it safe to say that that really started with the course in PC's nascent computer sciences program? It certainly did. I want to give a lot of credit to to PC in that regard, because it certainly helped me uh, snag my first job in uh, in the industry. Um, I took some programming classes at Providence College as an elective being an English major. I uh, wasn't quite sure exactly what I was going to do with it, but I just knew intuitively. And remember now, I'm I'm working for my dad during the summers. I'm making sales calls on IBM. So I knew of the computer industry. Uh, but I knew that I uh, wasn't quite sure of what that truly represented as opportunity for me. But what it was able to do was uh, those programming classes um, got me my entry-level entry position with a company called Control Data Corporation. And Control Data was a pioneer uh, in uh, distance learning, computer-based instruction. Uh, they had a system called PLATO, P-L-A-T-O, and I happened to be one of the new uh, employees assigned to help develop and promote this instructional technology, starting with the Department of Defense. And interestingly enough, remember, Nixon ended the draft in 1973. So the only people going into the Army after 1973, post-Vietnam, 
were high school dropouts and those who got in trouble with the law. Unfortunately, a good percentage of them were functionally illiterate at that time. And it was around 1977 when a NATO exercise uh, had the US Army forces participating and they came in dead last compared to their uh, NATO counterparts. And upon further analysis, it was concluded that as the Department of Defense began to deploy more mechanized, computerized systems, the service members were struggling readers and had very you know, soft skills in the computational area. And therein lies why they were performing so badly on the, uh, on the exercises in the battlefield. So the Army said, well, OK, we've got to do something real fast. Either we hire a bunch of community college professors to come on and teach them, help them get their GED. And we saw an opportunity to persuade the Army to give us a shot using the Plato system. And we were able to prove that we could get uh, these service members to the GED, passing the GED in half the amount of time that it would have taken them going the traditional route of sitting in a classroom with a community college professor. From that point, this technology accelerated as the Department of Defense uh, increased its investment in this technology. Uh, as they say, the rest is history. And today, as we see, there are now second, third, and fourth generation distance learning systems, some of which unfortunately has been um, used to a point where um, you know, remote learning has had to take a black eye during this pandemic um, and because at the time the technology was never developed to replace teachers. It was to supplement what was going on. Uh, but here we are and, and, and I have no regrets. I enjoyed that work. It took me to some great places. Um, fast forward, I got to work for Pearson Education a global leader in uh, multi-level, uh, multi-disciplined and, and uh, uh, different media, if you will, print, digital, testing systems, professional development, um, had a chance to work on Pearson's uh, early diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, helping to promote equal opportunity and access uh, across all of the different Pearson divisions. And one can see how it's easy to draw a straight line from that work back to an English degree from a liberal arts college, right? It all fits together. Answers no. that It answers that question, what can I do with an English degree? There's not an easy answer, but there are a million examples, right? And, million examples, and this absolutely. Is, this is a good one. Um, I noticed something in your biography I'd like you to tell us a little more about, and that is your work with uh, the children of migrant workers in Florida and the Carolinas and other places in the continental U.S., what was that all about? Again, this was with one of the Pearson um, divisions called Computer Curriculum Corporation, Triple C, um, which had an instructional system that was quite uh, adept in uh, what we call Title I, Chapter I uh, programs. These are students who uh, qualify under free and reduced lunch. Uh, these are students who are coming from under-resourced communities uh, up to and including some students who were part of the federally funded migrant education program. Uh, on the East Coast, it, there's a thing called the Eastern Stream, which where you have migrant workers that are planting and harvesting, starting uh, down in South Dade County and with the, the melons, if you will, going all the way up to uh, Connecticut and even up to Vermont, uh, inclusive of um, apple picking and, and the like. And so these families, these migrant families who were predominantly from Central and South America, as well as uh, parts of the Caribbean, including Haiti and the Dominican Republic, these families would move uh, every four to six weeks along this Eastern stream, going up and down. Unfortunately, if you can appreciate it, the children are sitting in a classroom uh, for four weeks, six weeks, they, the, the, the instruction gets them to a certain point, then the family picks up, moves to the next school district, which may be on a completely different um, learning uh, path, if you will, a different set of skills that are being addressed. And so you've got a lumpiness 
uh, in how these students' needs are being addressed. So once we determine that these families would go up, but then they would return to the same school, maybe six months later. And now how do you catch them up? And so when we realized this was happening, working very closely with the migrant education coordinators within the school districts that we were able to string along in this Eastern stream, uh, we convinced the administrators to let us put instructional technologies not only in the migrant camps so that they would have uh, supplemental remedial access after school and, and on weekends, but when the families picked up and moved, back then, five and a quarter inch floppy disks, mm. put the students' records on the disk. And then when you get to the next school, just hand the disk to the, to the administrators and they knew what to do with it. And it would pick the children right up where they left off. Wow. That was pretty cool. Imagine the impact of that work across all the, those families and all those individual people. That's, that's, uh, that's incredible and incredibly noble uh, undertaking. Throughout your career, Joe, and in fact, all the way back to your time at PC, you've had a vision for working to advance business opportunities for people of color, your family's business, even won a small business association award in the early 1970s. How does that work continue today? And I'm thinking specifically of your work in Rotary International. You're right. My dad was recognized by the uh, U.S. Uh, Department of Commerce in 1973 as a minority pace setter and President Richard Nixon acknowledged him with a beautifully written letter and dad went to Washington DC along with mom to receive that that recognition. My dad went on to uh, then found with the help of other entrepreneurs an organization called the Black Corporate Presidents of New England which was all about helping to empower uh, economic opportunities for those who uh, are coming from uh, again, uh, under-resourced uh, backgrounds. Um, my dad was also a Rotarian. So I'm a second generation member of Rotary International, which is a global uh, organization that is nonprofit based and focused on service above self within their respective communities. One of the things that Rotary International is noted for is, is working closely to eradicate polio worldwide. Uh, and before the pandemic, they were very close to achieving that goal with the help of funding from the Gates Foundation. Um, I have been a Rotarian now working on my seventh year. Um, I am a member of uh, a Rotary here on Southeastern Massachusetts, and I also am the uh, chair of District 7950 uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, which uh, helps to support the efforts of, of ex casting a wider net, if you will, for our 65 clubs here in Southeast and Massachusetts and portions of Rhode Island and Connecticut uh, to bring in new members who hopefully are a reflection of their communities today, uh, younger members, members who have disabilities uh, and members of color and members of the LGBTQ plus community. So uh, this is, very challenging work. It is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Um, there are some really great people that I get an opportunity to work with, uh, including none other than um, Ralph Tavares Jr., if that's a familiar name to sure you. Sure is. Yes. Uh, right. Uh, and others in Rhode Island who are engaged in this type of work. Ralph is a, a PC alum and a former uh, leader on the Providence College staff in, um, work, in working with students in diversity, equity, and inclusion programming, and now at Roger Williams, and just a terrific guy. I think, Joe, he was the first or second guest when we started the podcast. So we, we knew where to go at the beginning with, with Ralph, who was uh, just a great guy, great stories. Joe, PC honored you, your work and your impact earlier this year with the college's annual Martin Luther King Vision Award. That's part of PC's month-long uh, celebration of Dr. King's enduring impact. It was great to have you on campus for that and uh, and to you know, share that moment with, with you. But what did it mean to you for the college to recognize your work and your impact? It was humbling. Um, I certainly uh, didn't think that I had put forth enough effort to merit that kind of recognition. So it was incredibly humbling. Um, and I felt very honored to be included among a number of others, uh, including my dear friend and a well, 
former uh, roommate, uh, Reggie Nunnally, who similarly was uh, recognized for, for his contributions in the prior, prior years. Um, it was a feeling of having gone full circle. If you think about it, uh, 52 years, I'm coming in in 1970, here we are in 2022, and another two more years, we will be, I think, what they call golden friars, if the good Lord uh, has me <laughs> around long enough. Uh, I will share this with you, that um, as much as I appreciated the recognition, I am more appreciative, Joe, of this opportunity to sit with you in this podcast, um, to share my experience to share my story to share my truth and I one of the things that I had the opportunity to do was I spoke briefly with Father Picard um, and expressed to the college president uh, my wish to see other alumnus of color be a, given an opportunity to share their story to share their experience for what it's worth my hope is that a prospective student of color considering coming to Providence College might be curious and appreciative of an opportunity to sit and listen to someone who has come before them. And especially if that alumnus, that alumni's experience resonates with that prospective student or an existing student who might be challenged and struggling on campus. Just as I was influenced by listening to John Thompson, perhaps there's a, a student on campus who would appreciate listening to whether it's me or listening to Reggie Nunnally or listening to Al Cook or listening to um, Wally Johnson or listening to Mal Davis. I mean, I can go on and on and on. All these brothers and sisters, Wanda Ingram, um, Eva Irby, uh, you know, we, Kathy Graves, these are sisters who also came through Providence College and have great stories and experiences that deserve to be recorded and preserved for future listening. It's a great idea. Uh, Father Sukarna, as most people probably know, is the college's president, but to his credit, he got that word to us on the staff. And we've started talking about it. We have colleagues in the Phillips Memorial Library who have expertise in that kind of work, that oral history and preservation of stories. So uh, we are we are going to get to work, continue working on that and uh, take you up on this plan. It was it's a great thought and it will have real impact, I think. So thank you for thinking of that and, and for inspiring us to, to get moving on it and for sharing your story with us today. Thank you for the correction. I mispronounced his name, Father Sicard. Oh, I'm sure he doesn't mind. So <laughs> which is great. We should let people in on uh, our audience and on our timing here today, Joe. We started this. So it's Thursday, March 10th. We started talking a few minutes after 11 a.m. We have a hard deadline. The Friars and Butler are just about to square off in the, <laughs> the Big East tournament in Madison Square Garden. So we got to stop, right? Uh, no <laughs> Friars. A, a yeah, game maybe. to watch. It'll be uh, very exciting. What a season this has been. Just wonderful. Unimaginable, Absolutely. isn't it? <laughs> All hats off to Coach Cooley and uh, really congratulates, congratulations to Coach Cooley for uh, getting uh, Big East Coach of the Year. That's fantastic. And hopefully some more awards coming his way and, uh, and quite a few more games because we don't want this ride to end now. But uh, what a season it's been. Made the winter go by pretty fast, didn't it? Indeed. It so, well, Joe, thank you uh, for your time today, for sharing your remarkable story. Enjoy the onset of spring in the Big East Tournament, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you soon and, and hopefully you do stay in touch. Thank you very much, Joe. Our guest today, Joe Small. Thank you for listening to the Providence College podcast. For producer Chris Judge, I'm Joe Carr. Until next time. <laughs>